Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivo Siegmann, and welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is organized by the universities of Liverpool and Manchester and Liverpool John Moores University. Today's seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. I met Merle Beer a few years ago when I was a postdoc in Axel Munch's group at the Institute of Mathematical Stochastics and the Max Planck Institute of Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen in Germany. And Merle at that time was one of Axel's PhD students. When Axel once explained Merle's project, he said something along the lines of, well, Merle's project is uh, something like doing something that is actually impossible, but find a clever way so that it is kind of possible. I guess some people in the audience should either have warm memories of this feeling, or they might even say, yeah, that's exactly me at the moment. <laughs> so let me say a few words about Merle. Merle did her PhD in Göttingen in 2017, where she then stayed on for a few more months as a postdoc. She then became the name and visiting assistant professor in Berkeley, California. And about a year ago, she won the highly prestigious research fellowship of the German Science Foundation. And very recently, she has returned to Germany, just about enough to get rid of the jet lag, I suppose. And when she went back to Germany, she just made the very modest request, I think, to take one of California's uh, best known landmarks with her. So please join me in welcoming Merle Beer. I look forward to her talk on learning compositional structures. Um, I think you can now um, appreciate share. the great point where um, Merle is giving her talk. And uh, <laughs> now you can see her slides, but still probably admire um, the scenery. Yeah. So, um, um, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ivo, for the very kind introduction and um, for having me here today in your um, seminar. So uh, I will be talking about a couple of different related projects, are all somehow related under this general topic here. Um, and I want to make sure to highlight my major collaborators um, in these projects. So um, in particular, um, Chris Holmes and An Azim Ansari from Oxford um, and uh, Axel Munk and uh, Hoshin Lee and Laura Vanegas from Göttingen and Andreas Fucic and uh, Marta Peliciola um, from uh, Vienna and Linz. So um, at the beginning of my talk, I want to share a quote with you, uh, which I really like very much. It's from John Tukey. And uh, he once said that the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. Um, yeah, and for me that captures really nicely what I like so much about our field. And this is also how I would like to structure um, a little bit the t this talk today. Um, so what are, what are the different backyards? Maybe the first backyard um, statisticians sometimes like to call the application but it's really much more than that because this is what it is all about. We have some real world problem that we would like to solve. And uh, today I will be talking about some problems from cancer genetics, um, some problems from so-called E and R experiments, um, and I'll, you'll see some phylogenetic trees as well. But then um, I am a statistician, but also a mathematician. So I want to understand things a bit more deeply and um, uh, so we will also talk about some theory in particular identifiability issues and statistical efficiency and um, precise statistical uncertainty quantification and last but not least the last backyard is uh, maybe computation so the best method is useless if we cannot compute it efficiently. So let us start with uh, one particular um, problem that uh, we will consider here, and that's uh, from cancer genetics. So imagine you have a tumor, for example, this purple guy here, then the DNA of a tumor is usually mutated. And one particular type of mutations are so-called copy number variations. And that means that some parts of the genome are either duplicated or deleted. 
So that is illustrated here. So in a normal healthy DNA, every region of the DNA will appear exactly twice. So for example, the red region here, because we have one chromosome inherited from our mother and one from our father. However, in a cancer cell, it can happen that some regions are either duplicated, so that would be illustrated here on the right, where now the red region appears three times, or it could also be that a region gets deleted, uh, and then you could see that here on the left, where now the red region appears only once. And uh, in general, we can measure these type of copy number variations, for example, with whole genome sequencing data. And then the general structure that we see for this data is such a piecewise constant structure where those jumps, so here on the x-axis is the genome location, and those jumps correspond to regions where um, th uh, this, uh, there's a different copy number variation, uh, sorry, a different copy number, so a copy number variation. Um, and um, well, that, that's a, a general situation here, one thing to note is just by definition, a copy number um, can only be a number because we can, in one particular cell, we can have one, two, three, four, five, and so on copies of a region of DNA, but we cannot have a, a half of a copy or something like that. Um, Unfortunately, things now get even more complicated, and this is because uh, when we have a real tumor and we take some probe of cells, then there's usually not just one type of tumor cells, but there are rather a few different types, uh, so-called clones, and we could also get some healthy cell in our probe. Um, so that means if we now actually, for a real probe of tumor cells, get these um, data, the sequencing data, um, then what we observe is a mixture of all these different types of clones. And what you can see is that there are a lot of things which we don't know here. So first of all, we don't know how many different clones, so type of tumor cells, are there when we get our probe. And we also don't know what are the individual copy number variations of these different clones. And also we don't know what are the relative proportions of the different clones um, that then get mixed up um, in, in our data. Um, but there's actually one very important information here, and this is that we know um, by definition that the copy number variations of the individual clones can only take a few different um, possible values, and this we will denote as a finite alphabet. So in the, this particular setting, um, copy numbers can be one, two, three, four, five and so on and for biological reasons we also know that they are not super large so they that's a rather small set and in the following we will see how this information will um, help us to solve this problem here. So in general this type of problem um, can be seen as a particular type of a so-called blind source separation problem where we have some source functions and in the following we will denote those as f1 to fm and in the um, application setting we've just seen this would correspond to the individual copy number variations of the different clones and we have some mixing weights so for example this could be the physical mixing proportions of the tumor clones and then um, this results in some mixture and the word blindness refers to the fact that neither the sources uh, nor the mixing weights are known and there's a lot of literature in general about blind cell separation problems. And I just want to recap a, a few of the major lines of work in this direction. So one line of work which deals with these type of blind cell separation problems um, would be independent component analysis. And on a very basic level, the major assumption that is somehow made there is that these individual source functions are stochastically independent. But that's really not something we, we reasonably want to assume for these um, tumor clones because these different clones, they really evolve together in some sort of evolutionary process and um, that's, that's not quite the setting that we have here. Um, another line of work I want to mention is non-negative matrix factorization. But here really the key point is, and at least for the setting that we've just seen, is the matrix, um, because in general, this always requires to have several mixtures of the same sources. And if we would just have a single probe of cells, that uh, would also not be um, given in our case here. 
Um, there are deconvolution problems, but that really corresponds to some very specific structure of these um, sources F. That's also not what we have here. There's some line of work which looks um, at sparsity, so that would mean that these source functions are zero most of the time. So that's also not what we have here. But we have something quite similar here, and this is really the sparsity and the function values uh, where this given finite alphabet. And that's what we want to explore now, and um, there's really uh, very few statistical theory um, about this type of blind source separation problems. There is some work in that direction for specific alphabets, uh, but here we will consider a general alphabet and we will um, first start and discuss identifiability in general for these problems and then also go to um, statistical estimation of those quantities as well as uncertainty quantification in terms of confidence statements. Okay, so um, this is our setting here and um, in particular to fix notation. So for those source functions, we will here in the first part of this talk assume that we have such a piecewise constant structure as it is the case for this copy number variation application. And in particular, the function values can only take values uh, in some known finite alphabet. Um, and uh, for the mixing weights, we will assume here that they are positive and that they sum up to one. So that's motivated again by this, uh, for example, by this cancer example where this would correspond to fix physical mixing proportions, but it's also possible to drop this assumption and formulate this problem more generally. Um, here's a, a, like a toy example. So for instance, we could have three different source functions and the alphabet could be zero, one, and two. Uh, we could have three different mixing weights. So that would mean in our model, we multiply, multiply the source functions by the corresponding mixing weights. Um, then we sum up these functions. Again, that will be a piecewise constant function with this particular structure. And now in, this, uh, in the first part here, we will consider this in a regression setting where we have some discrete measurements of this piecewise constant function with some noise term. And um, for now, we will assume that this noise is uh, additive and Gaussian. And I will later um, also say something uh, about generalization where we maybe don't want to make such a strong Gaussian assumption. But for now, this is um, our modeling assumption. Yeah, so here's just an overview. So that's the model, what is known. So known as the alphabet. We'll also assume the variance to be known, which is clearly, wouldn't clearly not be the case in, in applications, but that's something at least for this change point structure, which we can um, estimate quite easily. And then there are a lot of things which we don't know. So we don't know the number of sources. We don't know the mixing weights. We don't know the source functions. So that means their number of change points, their change point locations, and their function values. And we like to um, estimate all those quantities here. And we do not just want to estimate them, but we want to make some um, pre statistically precise um, quant uh, statements about those in terms of confidence statements. But before we can go there, um, we really have to think about identifiability here. Um, and in order to um, get an idea about identifiability, it's very illustrative to look at a super simple example. And maybe the most simple example we can think of would just be a binary alphabet. So the sources can just take the value zero and one. Um, say we just have two different source functions and just you know some mixed sequence, just a, the most simple example. And now we can think what can happen. And it's actually very simple what can happen because we can just look at this function here and then we can first look at the smallest uh, value that we somewhere observe, which would be here. And then it's very easy to reason that this must be the situation where all the source functions take the smallest value, which is zero in this case. And uh, that's, that's where we observe the value zero then. And we can look at the second smallest value and again, um, we can convince ourselves that this must correspond to the situation where the source function with the smallest mixing weight is one and the other one is zero. So we will see exactly the value omega one. So in that way, we've identified omega one. And then we can go to the third smallest value. We can do the same reasoning. We see omega two and the largest value corresponds to one. 
So that's really super simple. Um, uh, and you might even wonder why are we even looking at this simple example, uh, but it's still quite illustrative because if we think about it more carefully, we realize that there are exactly two situations where this goes wrong, where this does not work. And uh, what are these two situations? So the first situation is when omega one is equal to omega two because then here in between these two values are going to be the same and we will never be able to distinguish whether f1 is zero and f2 is one or the other way around. So a necessary condition in order to have identifiability um, of the source functions is that all the different combinations of these alphabet values are indeed different in the mixture space. Um, so we can just write down this very simple condition. Um, and the second, um, uh, X, uh, situation where this goes wrong is when f1 is equal to f2 because then we never see these values omega 1 and omega 2 so we cannot um, identify them so we will only see these two values here and we cannot identify omega so a necessary condition again is that somewhere in our mixture function we do indeed observe the the uh, mixing weights omega 1 and omega 2 and now um, what is interesting uh, and what we've shown um, in this paper here is you can take these um, two conditions and now you can write down exactly the same two conditions but now for an arbitrary alphabet an arbitrary number of source functions and even an unknown number of source functions and it turns out that these conditions still um, guarantee um, identifiability so that's nice because um, now we have conditions um, which um, are actually which we can um, which we can discuss and they are actually very uh, reasonable for the cancer um, uh, genetics example and uh, we can go one step further and um, ask the question about how to actually estimate these quantities now. And um, uh, here um, we proposed a method which we call SLAM-R and it is a hybrid method of testing and estimation and it work is a so-called multi-scale um, approach that we follow here. Um, and the good thing um, or one of the um, good things about this is by combining this um, testing approach with estimation, we do not just get an estimate, but we also get confidence statements because we can always um, invert a test into a confidence statement and that's exactly what's going on here. And um, this is the example from the beginning. So the red curves, this are the, in this toy, from this toy example, the true underlying functions. And this um, black and gray curves are the estimates. And now you can see here, for instance, that the color code of these estimates kept, um, 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 uh, captures the confidence statements. So here we um, were using a confidence um, level of 90% and then uh, we're capturing this now simultaneously over the whole um, source functions and if we see a black color that will mean that there's only one possible alphabet value in our confidence band so that means we're completely certain up to this confidence level about um, the value of the source function. Um, dark gray means that we're slightly uncertain because there's another possible alphabet value and light gray would mean we're um, quite uncertain because in, in this confidence set, all uh, different values are possible. Um, so besides the confidence statements, we also analyze this procedure uh, in terms of uh, detection accuracy and uh, um, yeah, and showed that uh, we do obtain um, optimal rates in terms of the change point locations as well as also the mixing weights up to some uh, logarithmic factors, which might not be optimal. That's not so clear. Um, and here's a real data example. So this is a colorectal tumor. Um, uh, the, the black dots that you see here and the red curves are our estimates. So in general, we don't know for a real tumor um, what the underlying truth is, that that's kind of the whole point of this. However, this particular data set was generated in a lab where um, some known cell lines were taken um, and then mixed up. Uh, and therefore we do also have sequencing data of the individual clones and we can compare this and it does um, work quite nicely also um, for this data example here. Okay, um, so um, now I want to um, uh, 
modify this problem a little bit and talk about the multivariate version um, of this uh, setting. Um, and uh, we will also drop this um, change point structure. And uh, uh, one particular example that we considered here um, were the so-called evolve and resequence experiments together uh, with other, our colleagues from, um, from Vienna and Linz. And um, these experiments um, work as follows. So um, there, um, the idea is that we take some model organisms, uh, for example, we could take fruit flies, um, and then um, one will take some population of those fruit flies and uh, isolate them and uh, will apply some outer pressure. And then this population will evolve over time. And because um, no new genetic material comes in, um, this population will get more and more inbred. And um, after a while, only a few different types um, of um, genetic information um, re remain. And here we're, we're um, studying this on the haplotype level. So fruit flies are also deployed. So they also have one chromosome from our mother and one from our father. So the individual um, haplotypes, that's what we consider here. And um, here we look at, at SNPs. So um, uh, this means we have an alphabet which is just zero and one. So um, we have the different genome locations um, and this pool of haplotypes, uh, which all can then be encoded into such a zero and one vector. So this is again where we have this um, alphabet, finite alphabet structure. In this setting, just a binary um, alphabet. Um, but now uh, the difference here is, so there are two dif differences here. So the first difference is there, there's no change point structure anymore. So these SNPs, I mean, they're, they just take the values zero and ones, but there, there's not particular change point structure in that regard. Um, and the other difference is that this is now multivariate. And the reason is because we have this time structure, meaning that we observe um, several generations. And that means we have um, the same mixture, so the same haplotype but we observe them at different relative proportions um, because they evolve over time and their frequencies change. So um, that is just written down again the general structure. So um, we now have these two different matrices. So the first one is this haplotype structure and the second one is, this, uh, um, is now a matrix with mixing weights and um, we want to recover these two different matrices. Again, we have the finite alphabet, which we know uh, for the first matrix, um, uh, which uh, for example, could be binary for this um, haplotype setting. Um, and um, yeah, that is uh, what, uh, what the setting is now. And um, we analyze um, here um, a very simple algorithm for um, uh, recovering these um, individual uh, matrices. And um, this um, is very much motivated by this. Um, so when we, when we talked about identifiability and we saw that there is this ordering structure, then um, uh, we can generalize this also for higher dimensions. And this um, idea is um, yeah, part of this very simple algorithm that we employ here. And uh, to illustrate that, I just want to do this with an example again. So for example, um, we could be in dimension two. So that means we would observe two different mixtures of the same um, sources. Again, we look at the binary alphabet and say we have two, three different source functions. Um, then now, because our individual um, data points are now vectors, um, we can order them in terms of their norm. Um, and then what we can do is we can start with the one which has the smallest norm. And uh, again, we can realize, okay, this must be where everything is zero. Um, and then we can go to the second smallest value and uh, that must correspond to the first um, column of our mixing matrix. Um, so this is now all in the no noiseless setting, of course, but um, the, yeah, so that's just for illustration. So we can go to the next one and realize, okay, this must be then omega two. Then once we have the first two mixing weights, we can compute the, or, or we can uh, um, get the um, value which we would have obtained if um, the first two um, sources would be one and the others are zero. 
And then again, among the remaining ones, we can now again look at the smallest one um, where we find omega-3. And with that, we can compute um, the rest of the values. And following um, this ordering structure, um, this is a, a very simple algorithm to recover both the source functions as well as the mixing weights. Now, however, in practice, we do have noise, of course, and then uh, a very simple algorithm which we analyzed here is just to uh, first cluster the rows of our observation matrix um, and then um, apply this type of um, combinatorial algorithm um, to the um, centers. Um, and um, and uh, this algorithm um, can be shown to have nice theoretical properties. And in particular, so again, we will need identifiability conditions, which are very similar to the ones that we've discussed earlier. Um, and um, what is um, interesting maybe is that you can show about this algorithm that basically the estimation rates that you obtain for the mixture matrix are um, the same as if we, uh, up to constants are the same as if we would know the structure matrix exactly. So somehow we're um, losing um, nothing in terms of rates um, for um, estimation of these uh, mixture matrix um, compared to the situation where we would know this um, haplotype structure exactly. Um, yeah, and um, for the particular um, application for this E and R experiments or in general to recover um, haplotypes just from population data, from allele frequency data. Um, we targeted this procedure um, uh, more specifically and um, here's uh, a, a data example which again is not completely real data because for real data we just wouldn't know the underlying truth. So here we took some known um, haplotypes um, from this uh, paper here and then um, uh, simulated some mixing weights um, according to some other matching the distribution of um, real observed allele frequency data. And uh, here you can see um, the estimated and the true um, um, uh, frequencies, so the, the omega um, matrix over the different generations. And um, it uh, really does uh, work uh, nicely in practice. Okay, so uh, now I want to switch a little bit and uh, talk about um, something slightly different, although it's related. Again, we are going to learn, we are going to decompose um, our um, signal into different components, but um, this time these different components will correspond to inner nodes um, in a tree. And uh, as usual, we want to start with a particular um, application or a particular problem that we can think of. Um, and um, this data um, comes from this um, study here, which is a couple of years old, but the setting is really quite general and uh, appears in many different um, applications. But here we look at, at this one here um, from Mather and colleagues. Um, and uh, what they done there um, is they collected different probes of salmonella bacteria and um, for the salmonella bacteria, they extracted their DNA. And then they um, constructed from this DNA a so-called phylogenetic tree. And um, the, I'm, I'm not going to talk about how exactly they did this. So there are many different ways to do that. Um, but um, somehow what this tree is supposed to capture is the relationship um, between these different salmonella bacteria. So that means when I have two different salmonella bacteria and they sit close to each other somewhere in this tree, then uh, they are more related than bacteria which are far apart. So somehow we would like to think of an inner node in this tree as something like a most recent common ancestor of the um, subpopulation of salmonella bacteria which sit at the tip of this um, tree. So that's something we now assume to be given to us, this, this tree structure, which describes this relationship between this different salmonella bacteria. Um, but then there was also a second type of information, and that was whether those salmonella bacteria were taken either from a human host or from an animal host. So some of these bacteria infected a human and, and some infected an animal. And that's another type of information that we have here. Um, so we can write this 
down like this. So this is now the tree again. And now you can see here the color code where a uh, black color means that um, this probe was taken from a human host and the gray color means it was taken from an animal host. And the question that we now ask is, um, is there some dependency between this tree structure and this underlying pattern here of zero and ones? Or put it differently, um, is there, are there some subtrees or sublineages of the Salmonella population which are more likely to infect humans over animals? And just by visual inspection, we could um, think already that maybe here in this subtree, um, because we have a lot of black here by visual inspection, we would think, okay, maybe this sublineage is more likely to infect humans over animals. Um, but here in this area, it's maybe not so clear. Could could such a pattern just come by chance? Could it just happen by chance that we see maybe some structure here or is there really something? And uh, we want to um, quantify this precisely in terms of, uh, in a statistical way, meaning that we want to um, in a, uh, have some um, confidence statements um, and precise testing procedure for this. So uh, what is the global null hypothesis that we have in mind here? So that would be that there is no dependence between the tree and the underlying response um, distribution. So for these binary responses, that would mean no matter where in the tree I am, my class one probability is always the same. Whereas my alternative, or maybe we can also say the local hypothesis, is that there are um, some regions where the response probability is different. And we're modeling this by um, some active nodes. So that means we would have some inner nodes in the tree. And uh, now we can think of it in such a way that something happened here at the inner, at this inner node, maybe this corresponds to some most recent common ancestor, something changed. And uh, for the offspring, of this inner node, there's now a different class one probability, right? And we could have several of those active nodes, or we couldn't have any at all. And then um, we have some class, um, well, some response probability for this pattern of active nodes. Um, and this is what we uh, want to find out. So we want to find out, are there any active nodes? How many are there? Where are they? And uh, can we um, provide a precise statistical uh, um, guarantee for this? And um, yeah, here we um, proposed a method which we call TreeSec. And uh, really there's just, the, the only input that this method has is first of all the tree, which corresponds to some neighborhood structure of our observations and an additional response variable for those observations. And the only tuning parameter is a single confidence level. So for example, you could choose this to be 1%, 5% or 10%, whatever you like. Um, and then the method, is a, again a mix, uh, well, it's again a hybrid method of testing and estimation. So in the first step, we will estimate the number of active nodes. Um, and um, this um, is using such a multi-scale test statistic that we've also used earlier for the SLAM-R method. Um, and then in the second step, um, once we have that, we estimate the location as well as the um, success probability as a constraint maximum likelihood um, estimator. And uh, yeah, this can also be computed, computed efficiently by following a tree index dynamic programming scheme where you go from the bottom to the top or to the root node of the tree. And the type of guarantees which you get are as follows. So in terms of confidence statements, first of all, you get a control for the overestimation error. So that means the probability of your estimated active nodes being larger than the true number of active nodes is upper bounded by your confidence level. So if you set that to be 5%, then up to these 5%, you're sure that whatever you detected with this method is indeed also there. Um, and uh, moreover, you get a um, confidence set for the location of the active nodes, um, where in the tree they are, and um, also for the signal. 
And now, in addition, if you also want to, uh, we also have results about the detection power. So, of course, there we now need to make additional assumptions in terms of a minimum clade size as well as a minimum distribution shift. Because when, when the subtree is super small or when the change in dif distribution is super small, you uh, will never have a chance to detect that. But if you assume some minimum um, size of such a sub uh, active node subtree as well as a minimum shift in distribution, um, then you can uh, get a detection power um, um, which uh, shows that you also bound the um, underestimation error with some exponential rate um, and um, you also get a localization of your um, of the localization of the um, active nodes with a rate which is, which is also minimax optimal. And this minimax optimal rate is for general trees. Um, and uh, yeah, well, you can show for general trees, this, you cannot improve this possibly up to the slug n factor. However, if you make um, further assumptions about the tree, and one um, easy example would be a perfect tree, um, then in a perfect tree, um, we can even show that you get exact um, recovery of the location um, of those active nodes as well. Um, yeah, and this is the example that we've seen um, at the beginning with the salmonella bacteria. Um, and um, what we see here is that um, the method here estimated two different active nodes. Um, and here are the two different locations. So the first one um, is the one which is maybe quite obvious um, and um, corresponds to this um, cluster here, which you can also see by visual inspection. But then there's also a second one. So um, I think this, this should be um, something like alpha um, equal to 5%, I think. Um, so up to your 5% confidence level, we are sure that there are at least two different active nodes. Um, but we also see that for the second one, we have quite some uncertainty. So these are the orange dots that correspond to the confidence, um, confidence set for the location of the active nodes. And this is also reflected here in the confidence band. So the orange band here is a confidence band for the location of the, um, as for the success probability and the red curve here is the estimate. Um, okay, so um, now um, for the um, for the tree sec method as well as for the segmentation method um, with um, SLAM R, um, we always had one assumption which is maybe a bit restrictive um, in, in many applications. Or well, maybe the first thing I should say um, is here we were looking at binary responses, but we can do the same if we have continuous responses, and uh, we could make um, a Gaussian assumption, for example. So in general, we can we can do this if we have some ex one parametric exponential family. But um, the problem in applications is that often um, it might be a bit restrictive to assume something like a Gaussian distribution for your data. Um, and you really would like to be um, a bit more, you have something which is more robust and which doesn't need such a um, strong parametric distributional assumption um, for your response um, observations. And um, we recently um, looked um, at a procedure how one can generally extend these multi-scale methods um, um, for uh, to a more robust way, in particular to a setting where we look at quantile regression. Um, and um, I just want to um, highlight this, this general idea behind um, this um, here. So um, for example, if we make a Gaussian assumption as we did um, for the um, SLAM R method, so with these copy number variations um, example, uh, the first example, um, there, um, if we want to apply these multi-scale um, approaches, um, we're combining testing and estimation. Um, and the particular testing problem um, just corresponds to a situation where our null hypothesis um, corresponds to some um, mean theta zero. So the mean would now be the quantity with respect to which we want to segment our data. Or for example, in tree sec, where we want to um, find um, classes of subtrees which, have a, which would have a different mean then. Um, 
And because this is such a nice parametric testing problem, we can look, for example, just at the likelihood ratio test, and uh, we can um, invert this into a confidence statement. We get a confidence box. Um, and then this general idea of um, the Smitty scale method in this context of these segmentation problems is that we look at these confidence boxes at all different locations. And when we are in a situation um, where two of these confidence boxes don't overlap. So these confidence boxes hold their level simultaneously over all different scales and um, locations of boxes, then um, this would mean that um, we have to insert um, another segment or another subgroup in the tree, depending on what type of problem we're looking at. Um, and But now we would like to do this without making this strong Gaussian assumption or in general without making such a strong parametric distributional assumption. Um, and uh, one thing what we can do is we can just um, more generally in, instead of segmenting with respect to some parameter in a, in a distribution, um, we can just look at uh, the median. Um, of our observations and uh, want to um, segment um, our um, data in terms of the median. And we don't want to make any distributional assumptions, really no distributional assumptions at all. Besides the only thing that we still assume is that our different um, observations are independent, but nothing other than that. And one uh, simple trick that we can do here is that um, we can rewrite um, the testing problem for the median uh, now in terms of Bernoulli observations. So for every um, observation, now if we have a given candidate level, we just transform this into a Bernoulli, where we, which is just the, the indicator um, of whether our observation is larger or smaller than this candidate value. And uh, now we're again in a good situation because now we're back into our, in our previous easy parametric setting because for a Bernoulli distribution, we can do the same thing. We apply a likelihood ratio test and we get confidence boxes and we can follow the same strategy. And uh, yeah, this is what we explored um, here in, in this paper, this approach. Um, and here are a few examples how, how to illustrate that. So um, if we have really a Gaussian um, a distribution um, with the same variance, then um, we always um, see here some observations and the red curve is always the true median um, or which is also the mean for the Gaussian case. Um, and the black curve would correspond um, to an estimator where we make this Gaussian assumption. So in particular here in this normal change point setting, we applied um, this uh, method from um, Frick and colleagues, which is um, called uh, SMOOTH. Um, and uh, the blue curve here is um, this uh, new approach where we um, do median regression and uh, where we don't make such a Gaussian assumption. And here you see data which is truly Gaussian and you can see that both um, are um, roughly the same. Maybe the median loses a little bit in terms of detection power if you look at, at this example. Um, but if now the model assumption is violated and here is a setting where we are still Gaussian, but now the variance increases um, here from left to right. And there um, we clearly see um, one example where we have an advantage because the uh, method which assumes, assumes a Gaussian, a, a constant variance and Gaussian assumption will overestimate here in the high variance regime. But um, by not making any of those assumptions at all, um, we don't fall into that problem. Here is another example where we have Cauchy data. So Cauchy data will have a lot of outliers. So in order to actually see something, we need to zoom into here, right? So now I zoom in and now I see a bit more clearly that I have the structure here. And um, if we would apply some method which, which makes such a Gaussian assumption, then we see that, yeah, this is absolutely um, not reasonable anymore. We highly overestimate because the, the model assumption is just violated. Um, but if we um, yeah just make this median assumption, um, then um, this does not happen. Um, so we analyze this procedure also theoretically. 
and um, besides the confidence statements which we get again we can also show that um, in terms of estimation rates um, where um, yeah this median regression provides an optimal um, segmentation up to um, possibly some log factors so for example here you see the um, rate again of the change point locations and that's um, again the one over n rate possibly up to some log factor okay so um, yeah, then I'm um, um, basically at the end. So uh, yeah, let me summarize. So we started with these blind source separation problems with finite alphabets and we talked about identifiability. Then we first considered this in a change point regression setting, uh, obtained uh, um, on the one hand minimax optimal estimators, but also confidence statements. Um, then we looked at the multivariate setting of this problem. Um, motivated, for instance, in these E and R experiments, again, obtained um, estimates with minimax optimal rates. Um, and um, then we looked at tree structures um, with confidence statements and um, detection results. And at the end, I talked um, about um, robust segmentation, where we want to drop all these parametric assumptions and only look um, at uh, median regression or more generally quantile, quantile regression. And here are um, the references from from uh, bottom to top that matches the yeah so that matches the, the structure of the talk okay thank you uh, thanks a lot Mana. um i really enjoyed that are there any questions um on Mana's talk so you can either ask your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you have any questions So um, if there are no questions, uh, I actually have one. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, when you um, go back to the example with the um, yeah, multivariate um, <coughs> blind source separation, so you mentioned that um, you need to cluster when you are in the noisy case. Yeah. So um, when you do the clustering first, um, do you have some information um, how much your accuracy depends on the accuracy of the clustering or um, because I mean, you, you need to use the clustering yeah. method first and then um, after you've done the clustering, you can um, look at how um, your um, method proceeds from that clustering. Yeah, so um, we so when we analyzed this, and also this is how we um, implemented it, we used a particular type of clustering. So we used um, a Lloyd's clustering, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, also with a particular initialization. Um, and um, yeah, so we do rely on the fact that this is this particular clustering, and we do make use of um, results about the accuracy of this class. Uh, so, so there are um, works which analyze the, the general analyze um, accuracy of Lloyd's clustering, and we do make use of that. So um, yeah, so, so absolutely, uh, it does depend on the on the accuracy of the clustering. And when we prove our results, then we do make use um, of um, yeah, um, rates, um, clustering rates um, for the particular type of clustering algorithm, namely Lloyd's clustering um, that we use here. Yeah. And in this application, is it um, easy to decide how many clusters you need to look for or um yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, so the way we are doing it is as follows. Um, so, uh, one easy one thing to notice is that um, the number of so we have this uh, structure here of um, this product of two matrices, and then we have some noise. And um, if you look at the rank of this this matrix here then um, you can see that uh, the rank is actually exactly the number of sources. Of course, you need some assumptions uh, here, but one assumption that we also make guarantees that uh, basically, yeah, you, you, so as long as, um, um, as, long as uh, these uh, two matrices have full rank, then you will see that the rank of the 
the product of the matrix is exactly the, this M, which uh, is uh, uh, basically what you need to know in order to know how many clusters mm -hmm. to look for. Um, and in order to estimate that uh, here in this setting, we just did a, um, um, a singular value thresholding actually. Um, so yeah, we looked at the singular values um, of, our, um, of our data matrix. And then we did a thresholding on the singular values and there's some theoretical justification um, for that in, in some relatively recent work. Um, and um, yeah, but, but we didn't derive any theory for then our procedure about estimating the number of sources, but that's just how we do it in practice. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is now a question in the chat. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, somehow Shin I cannot Chen? see the see the chat. Uh, let me, or maybe you can just read it. Okay, I, I just. I, yeah. I think the problem is that the chat somehow. I don't know. I, I don't know what the problem is, but um, the the question is mm -hmm. from Shun Chen, and mm -hmm. um, they ask: Can this method be used for time series data analysis? Oh, uh, interesting question. So somehow you have something in mind where. Um, you have a particular dependent structure, I guess. Um, um, it's it's a bit tricky. So so as like the current implementation doesn't. I mean, I, I was talking about different methods here, but for none of them we have a current implementation which specifically could take something like a auto uh, correlation into account and. Um, um, the, the robust method I've talked about at the very end, um, that definitely empirically gives you some sort of robustness also in terms of autocorrelation. Um, but um, yeah, if you want to um, take this into account explicitly, you would somehow, at least for these multi-scale methods, so that's not the application that we see right here, but um, for example, in, in this setting here, um, you would somehow need to correct for this autocorrelation structure in your tests, which is something you can do in principle, and there are some works um, who, who looked at that, but which we haven't done. Uh, and for the robust setting, it's, it's going to be even a bit more tricky because there, um, if you remember, the only assumption essentially that we made was independence of your observations. And if you drop that, which you have to drop if you want to assume some autocorrelation structure, you're not left with anything. So you, you will need something else. You, so you will need to make some other assumptions. So for example, then go back to some specific, um, yeah, outer correlation structure that you assume or some specific parametric assumptions. Um, yeah, so my, my short answer is we haven't really addressed that here. Um, uh, and I think some parts will also be tricky, but yes, yeah, that was, would also be an interesting direction to go further in general. Yeah. So, um, Shun Chen, I hope that answers your question. Um, if yeah, you like, yeah, you can. Very good. Very good. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so, I, I assume it's that it's probably. It's an engineering problem. So, I think that your method is very good. So, probably we can use your method. Yeah, that, that would be really cool. Just um, drop me an email if you have um, any questions. I think my email was probably, was it in the, on the website? It's on, on my website, which I think is linked on the, in your talk. Yeah, if yeah. there are any problems, um, I might also be able to forward you to Mela. Um, yeah, um, if there are no further questions, then um, I would just like to thank Mela again. So I will try to give her a big clap. <laughs> Thank you. And um, yeah, uh, before we stop, I just would like to um, announce the talks of the upcoming seminars. So in the next week, we will have a talk hosted by the University of Liverpool by Dr. Bruno Martins from Warwick. That will be um, on Wednesday as well, but at 1 p.m. instead of 2 p.m. And um, the talks further away are um, in two weeks. On Monday, there will be a Manchester-hosted talk by Dr. Lali Hakverdi 
uh, from Berlin in Germany. And um, yeah, even further away in um, three weeks, there will be Dr. Eda Zavala from Birmingham, also hosted by uh, the University of Liverpool. So um, I would like to thank Mala again for her really nice talk and um, all of you for your attention. And um, yeah, I hope to see you again in the next weeks. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.